So we're here for the first time. If you haven't been here for a while, we are beginning a mini-series for the month of November dealing with the subject of stewardship. Luke chapter 12, and I'd like to begin reading this morning with verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that waited for the Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and she began to beat the men servant and maidens, and to eat and drink and be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which kneweth his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes, for to whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom have committed much of him, they will ask the more. May the Lord's rich blessing be to the Lord's word, and may be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we pray that you might speak to us, that we might behold a good word, an encouraging word from your law. Yes. And let this, the words of your servant's mouth, and the meditations of his heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to, to try to complete our thoughts from last week from this whole idea of a proper perspective of stewardship. And we're going to try to be economical with our time because we do have a baptismal service this morning. Our sister uh, Angie Bradley is being baptized, and that's uh, uh, Tierra and uh, Xavier's mother. And we're just so grateful to the Lord. Uh, the Lord is put in her heart to give her life to the Lord and uh, to follow the Lord in baptism. A proper perspective of stewardship. And then last week, and our technicians may be to find our outline from last week, but we introduced this, this topic of stewardship because it's not a term that we use in the 21st century church. But it is a biblical term, and stewardship carries the idea of one that is a manager, uh, a, a trustee, an overseer of the affairs of another. And so as Christians, God calls us to himself, and he makes us stewards. We are the managers of the kingdom of God. And sometimes as Christians, we don't really understand that God is not mediating his kingdom through the human government, even though God is sovereign over human government. 
and God has instituted human government. But human government has no authority over the church. It cannot usurp authority over the church. The church is accountable to Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ only. That's why Paul, in 1 Timothy 3, he talks about the church being the pillar and the ground for the truth. So the truth has been deposited with the church. The church is a repository of the truth of God. That's why in Jude, Jude talks about that we're to more earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. So as Christians, we must see ourselves as the managers of God's kingdom. Now most of you are employed and you work on jobs and there are supervisors and then there are unauthorized supervisors. <laughs> there are those who have the, the, the legitimate rule and responsibility for providing supervision and those who usurp it and take it upon themselves. As Christians, we have the legitimate delegated authority from the Lord Jesus Christ himself to be the managers of his kingdom, to be the stewards of God's kingdom. And as stewards of God's kingdom, we are then in store, we are stewards of what God entrusts to us. And we talked briefly about that on last week. God, he entrusts to each of us our own life and the time that we have. So we become stewards, we become the managers of the time that God allots to us. Amen. And each of us have the same amount of time in a day. Now we may not live uh, the same length of time, we have the same amount of time each day, and so God expects us to be managers, to be stewards of our time. We talked about that on last time. We also talked about the stewardship of our talents. Our talents. And some of them are innate natural abilities that when we were conceived in our mother's womb, within our DNA and our genetic makeup, God programmed in that we would have certain natural talents and certain natural abilities. And we'd be able to learn certain things. We would have certain skills that we would be able to develop after we were born. We are stewards of those talents. And so for many of us, we were able to take some of those talents, pursue more education, and therefore after pursuing more education became, uh, became credentialed in some particular area, and we were able to then take those talents and then earn a living to meet the needs of our family and of ourselves, and also be to support the church. We're to be the stewards of those talents. And sometimes as Christians, Christians don't really quite understand that they should slice out some of their time and some of their time should be given to the minister of the local church. And that's just not talking about coming to church for Sundays, discipleship or Sunday worship time. You need to do that for your own soul to be fed and to be edified and to be built up and to receive instruction from, from the word of the Lord and to have the fellowship of the saints and enjoy the fellowship of corporate worship. But there also needs to be a slice of time that you slice out and say, I'm going to devote this time to help the church to help the ministry of the church and to serve in some capacity in the ministry of the church because I know that the church needs some of my time, my availability. And when I bring my availability, when I bring my time, then I also bring my talent. And so what I'm asking each and every one of you who are members of Grace Bible Church to do is to, to write down what your talents are, where you think your strengths are, where you think your talents are. And then we're gonna see if we can't, some kind of way, create a venue for you to use some of that talent here at the church. Some of your talent in, in a way that is directly related to ministry. That's what it means to be a steward of the kingdom of God. And so the last message we're gonna talk about your treasure, because that's the one that's the nearest and the dearest to us. <laughs> But God wants some of our time, God wants our talent, and as we'll see in the text, God wants us to give of ourself to him, and when we give ourself to him, we find it a lot easier to write a check. We find it a lot easier to deposit something in the offering basket. You know, I'm often not criticized, but I'm reminded by the church leadership, you don't talk about money enough, and I never have in the 20 years that I've pastored. 
I've never spent a whole lot of time talking to the church about money. Because I feel if I got to spend a lot of time talking to them about money, then what it means I'm not doing a very good job in talking to them about ministry and about service and about what it means to be a believer and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And so what we're trying to do is to win people's hearts to be for the kingdom. And if people's hearts really are about the kingdom, about seeing people saved and discipled and nurtured and built up, about seeing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ being the robust, energetic, effective body it's supposed to be, then people will get excited about the ministry of the church and their excitement will spill over, not only when you're trying to be reared up to clap your hands and to, and to praise God, not only when it's time for us to have a time of worship, but when we, when we get time to take the offering, that's to be the most noise in the house, Deacon Mitchell. When it comes time to receive the offering, everybody ought to be so excited, and they ought to be almost running over themselves coming down the offering, the aisle to present their offering. Preach, young man, preach. <laughs> I'm reminded of a story of this young boy and uh, he had just, just come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he really understood what it really meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He understood that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, and that God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for his sins. And he really wanted to show his devotion to the Lord. He really wanted to show his devotion to the Lord. So it came time for him to take the offering, and the preacher get up and start to... to uh, to, to prepare to receive the offering. You know, in, in most churches, on the day of Pentecost, preach, Peter preached for five minutes and 3,000 people got saved. In the church today, we preach for 30 minutes and we take $5. <laughs> but the, band was, the, the preacher was talking about the offering and the young boys, I wish that preacher would, would shove so I could give my offering. I wish that preacher would stop talking so long so I could give my offering. And finally, the preacher said, well, everybody pre please bring their offering to the to the altar, and the young boy got up and he ran down the aisle and he jumped up and got an offering basket. He says, Lord, you, all that I have belongs to you, and everything in my pockets belong to you. I would love to see that spirit break forth in our church. I'm a random another young fellow, I think he was uh, from Mount Hope, West Virginia, and uh, he was faithful in Sunday school as a little boy. And one day his mother got him up for Sunday school and she said, under her son, now here is two dimes. One dime is for the Sunday school. That belongs to the Lord. The other dime is for you so that you can go to McLean's store to buy you some cookies and a soda pop after Sunday school. So the young boy running to Sunday school to get to Sunday school, he slipped and the money fell out of his hand. And one of the dimes started to roll down the sidewalk. It came to the edge of the curb. It bounced up. It went over in the sewer drain. The other dime he was able to catch with his hand. And he looked at the dime in the sewer drain, and he looked up toward heaven. He looked at the dime in his hand, and he said, Sorry, Lord, there go your dime. <laughs> now, I don't know that fellow's name, but I understand he's from my home, West Virginia. <laughs> Why is it that it's always God's money to get wasted? Why is it this God's dime that always end up in the sewer drain? And the one that we have left belongs to us. That young man did not understand stewardship. Because had he understood stewardship, he would have at least said, Lord, I tell you what I do, I go to the store, I'm going to break this dime, I can get five cookies in their one sense of peace, and I can give you half of it. At least I'll split it with you, Lord. But that's not the way we normally think. But that's what a steward, a steward understands. Everything that I have belongs to the Lord, and I'm responsible for it all, and i got to manage it all because i got to give account to the Lord at the end of the day. Now, I want to back up because this chapter really, the whole chapter deals with stewardship. And we're kind of, we went to the end, now we're going to back up, and I want you to see this. As the, as the chapter opens up, Jesus is given some, just some profound teaching from the Word of God. And in the middle of Jesus' presentation, in verse 13 of Luke chapter 12, a man jumps up, interrupts Jesus' sermon, and he says, Lord, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. Now, Jesus was not giving a sermon on inheritance and on probate court. He was talking about the kingdom of God. 
So Jesus says, well, who, who made me an arbiter? Who, who, who made me a, the head of the probate court? And so then Jesus teaches them a profound lesson in that text. And what he says is, beware, be on God, watch out for covetousness. Covetousness is a term we don't use. We use the term greedy. <laughs> He's just greedy. She's just greedy. So Jesus says, be aware of covetousness. Watch out for greed. And then he goes on to tell a parable. It's a parable of a rich man who was a farmer. And he had a bumper crop. And he had so much crop, he had no place to place all of his harvest. And he sat down one night and he said, what in the world I'm going to do? I got so much stuff, I don't have no place to put my stuff. And some of us got so much stuff, we don't have no place to put the stuff. So he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down the barns that I have. I'm going to build myself bigger barns. I'm going to store all this stuff in my barns, and then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take it easy because i got enough to last me for a long time. That's the story of Jesus. And then he went on to say, he says, but that night, the man got a visitor from the death angel. And the death angel said to him, thy fool. Now that's powerful. Because in the Bible, Jesus instructed his disciples, don't call people fools. Yet in teaching them this parable about greed and about covetousness, he calls the man in the story a fool. He says, thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and then who shall those things be that you have gathered and brought together? Now to understand the point here, why in the world did Jesus call this man a fool? Well, I'm going to give it to you pretty fast. He called him a fool, number one. He called the man a fool because he failed to acknowledge the source of his wealth. The Bible says the ground of a certain man brought forth plentifully. The source of his wealth was God. God was the source of his wealth. God is the one who had allowed him to own the ground. God is the one who had put the necessary nutrients in the ground to cause the crops to grow. God had sent the rain and caused the sun to shine, but he took responsibility and he took credit himself. He failed to acknowledge the source of his wealth. That's one reason he called him a fool. A second reason he called him a fool, not only did he fail to acknowledge the source of his wealth, but the text says, he says, I will tear down my bonds and I will build bigger bonds and I will store this stuff in these bigger bonds and these will satisfy my soul. Second reason is because he had, a, he had a fool for a counselor and for a client. He counseled himself. He decided within himself what he would do. And then he tried to satisfy a spiritual need with material things. And that is the great curse upon this nation today. A nation with unprecedented wealth. A nation that can produce more stuff and produce more things than what the nation can consume. And that's why we have to export so much to other nations because we cannot consume all the stuff that we have in this country. And so we're trying to satisfy a spiritual vacuum, a spiritual need, a spiritual hole in our heart, and we're trying to satisfy it with material things, as was this man. He tried to satisfy the spiritual with the material, and the material just simply cannot satisfy the spiritual. The young people today who are running as fast as they can to buy the latest of this or buy the latest of that and will do just about anything they have to do to get it, thinking that if I get this, I'm going to really feel better about myself. If I get this, I'm going to satisfy this yearning, this longing that I have deep down within myself, but it just ain't so. He failed to acknowledge the source of his wealth. He had a fool for a counselor and a client, and he tried to satisfy a spiritual vacuum with material things, and then on top of that, he didn't plan to die. <laughs> he made no preparations for death. He basically said, I'm going to store all this stuff up. I'm going to now, I can retire early, take early retirement, go fishing when I want to go, sit back in my lazy boy, have me a giant screen, flat screen plasma TV, watch ESPN, CNN, all that other stuff, and just enjoy myself because I'm going to live forever. And Jesus said he was a fool. 
But I want you to see something else that we often don't look at when we read this text. Look with me, if you would, in Luke chapter 12 at verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So after he had dined voluptuously at his table, had gotten up and taken his shower, slid into his satin pajamas, waltzed up the sparrow staircase, went into the master bedroom suite, slid down between the satin sheets and pulled the cover up over him and closed his eyes to get some Z's. That was a voice in his head, thou fool. Thou fool. Thou fool, thou imbecile, thou empty-headed Spiritually bankrupt wretch, thou fool. This night, your soul is going to be required of you. And then all this stuff that you have amazed, who's going to get it? There used to be a secular song about that. <laughs> Who's sleeping in your bed while you sleep in somebody else's bed? <laughs> Some of y'all remember that. Jesus says, thou fool. All of your labor, all of your work has been in vain. It has been for naught because you have not invested anything in the kingdom of God. And then in verse 21, Jesus said, So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus says the person who is laying up stuff for themselves now, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't plan for retirement because you ought to. But you can't plan for retirement at the expense of investing in the kingdom. And so he says, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then who shall all those things be that you, for that you've laid up? And then he says, so is everyone who is not rich toward God. And that richness toward God, it's not merely in terms of material things. It is the investment of your time, the investment of your, your talent. It is where your heart really is. And understanding that is beginning to understanding stewardship. One more major point, and then I'll be, be through. So Jesus goes on and he, he talks to his disciples about not being anxious in verse 22, and not being preoccupied with how they were going to meet all of their physical needs in verse 23, of not losing their faith in verse 24 to see that if the ravens who don't sow, who don't reap, and they have nowhere to store anything, yet if God can feed them, God can take care of his children. And not to be anxious and not to be worrying about everything because that doesn't add any stature. It doesn't extend your life. As a matter of fact, worry subtracts from your life. And then he makes this contrast. He says, now here's Solomon, one of the wealthiest men that ever lived on the planet. But even Solomon, when he was arrayed, and when Solomon put on his royal regalia, Solomon in all of his majesty and all of his glory was not arrayed like a little lily in the field. God has taken the time to prepare the lily of the field and to dress the lily of the field in such grandeur and in such splendor, and the lily has a very short lifespan. It comes up today. It's dead in a few days. If God would take so much time to take care of the lily of the field, how much more will God take care of his own? How much more will God take care of his own? So Jesus says, a steward must understand that the greatest investment that he or she can make is an investment in God's kingdom. It's an investment in the heavenly treasury, in the heavenly bank account. And so he goes on to 
encouraged them to, to put their faith in him and to put their trust in him. And then in verse 35, he then talks about this idea of being ready. He said, because the, the, the good master of the house is going to return. And when the good master of the house returns, he is expecting to receive a return on the investment that he's made in the lives of his servants and of his stewards. And so in verse 41, and we'll close here, Peter said, Lord, now who are you talking to? Who is all this stuff for? And Jesus said unto him, who is the faithful and sensible steward? Who is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Now what is he talking about? Jesus always uses these parables about masters and the servants, about kings and his servants. And so here is the illustration here, is that the master, the Lord Jesus Christ, he appoints his servants to be over his affairs. And then the master leaves to take care of some business. And then the master returns, and when the master returns, he, he's wanting to see how has his servants managed in his absence. So Jesus says, blessed, Happy is that servant who that when the master returns, that master finds him doing what he was supposed to do. He was rationing out the blessings of the master to the servants. Verse 43, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I send you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. And then in contrast, there's that slave who was not faithful and who did not give and who did not minister to the slaves or to the servant. And so when the master returns, that servant is disciplined by the master. God is calling us to be stewards, to be stewards of his kingdom. I, I want to read you something. A lot of stuff come across my desk in a week. But I thought this was worthy of you hearing it because this just involved the church. A lady writes to the church from a low place in Georgia. And she writes, Dear Grace Bible Church family, how you doing? Fine, I hope. <laughs> I just wanted to drop you a few lines <clears throat> to let you know how much I appreciate what your church has done for my daughter. And she gives her daughter's names and others like her. No one except God knows what this whole situation almost did to me. The devil thought he had me, but I had to pray and remember God's teachings, that God is in charge. I had to thank God for all things and remember that my daughter's situation could have been so much worse, except grace and mercy had already paid for her. I'm here down in this little town in Georgia and my daughter's incarcerated in Charleston, West Virginia, which is quite a long way from our family. However, my faith and trust in God has made things possible and made it able for me just to make it and continue to praise God. I'm elated that, as usual, God has sent angels to me in the person of the Grace Bible Church family, and I'm so blessed just having your support. As you are aware, I'm the mother of 11 children, eight of which were adopted. A mother's love can endure quite a bit when faith is involved. And I continue to make all, and God continues to, to make all things possible as long as I have faith. I'm requesting your prayer for myself as well as my whole family for continuous strength to, to fight for my daughter. I've asked my daughter to surrender and to give her life to the Lord. Clearly, she must know that this situation has proven that just like God saved Daniel from the lion's den, God has spared her life from destruction Amen. and saved her from a similar lion's den situation so that she give her life to God. Again, I want to thank you for being the angels of the Lord and for all that you've done for my daughter and for others. I hope to visit your church on my next visit to Charleston. May God bless and keep you. Thank you, and she signs her name. 
stewards of the kingdom. Stewards of the kingdom. And so in this situation, the stewards of a little jail ministry at South Central Regional Jail that most of y'all don't know nothing about, but a group of men and women from this church have been going for seven to eight years faithfully every Tuesday night from 6.30 sometime as late as 11 o'clock, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with men and women who are incarcerated. Stories of the kingdom, stewards of that, of that kingdom opportunity. Some of these people we may never know. And many people never write. And they go down in lockdown and talk to people in lockdown who are in solitary confinement to try to share with them the good news of the gospel of the grace of God, being a steward of that kingdom opportunity so that when those people stand before a living God in eternity, they will be without excuse. They will not be able to say, I was in South Central Regional Jail, but nobody came to me. But God will say, oh yes, yeah, somebody came to you. And somebody took the time to come to you and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. Someone inconvenienced themselves. Someone took a slice out of their time, out of their busy schedule because they thought that your soul was important enough to hear the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. That's what it means to be a steward of the kingdom. Now, now I want to make this a little bit more personal because I, I never want to embarrass anybody. But we'll be baptizing a young lady here this morning that we would have never known had it not been someone says, I'm going to be a steward of this slice of the kingdom. And there are those kids in this neighborhood, and someone needs to befriend these young people. And so people from this church start to befriend young people from this street. Picking them up, Danny dies, taking them different places, bringing them into the hugs ministry, and they start loving on these kids and telling them about Jesus. And some of these kids put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were baptized up here in these waters, and then they went back and they told their mama about these people over here who was teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ, who was loving on them and trying to encourage them, and somewhere along the way, I don't know how it happened, I don't even know, need to know how it happened, but some kind of way, mama ends up showing up at the Monday night women's fellowship meeting, and someone in the women's fellowship meeting tells them about Jesus Christ. Now, what if the women's fellowship didn't want to meet on Monday, or didn't have time to meet, or didn't think it was important because they was there, stewards of the kingdom? God was able to bring a harvest, an increase that will not only change his mother's destiny, but hopefully by the grace of God, also help her and with her children. That's what it means to be the stewards of the kingdom. It's not just about money, but it does take money. One of the great intellectuals uh, from Charleston, West Virginia, is, is Tony Brown. Truly intellectual. Author, well renowned, traveled all over the world. And Tony Brown came to Charles once he was speaking, and Tony Brown said, Money just is not that important. He says, Money not really that important. He said, But I do rank it right up there just below oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> no, in this world, you have to have some resources to do the kingdom work. As I've tried to share with you in the past, if you were going to run in the Kentucky Derby and if you had any hopes of trying to win, you couldn't show up with a mule. You got to have a thoroughbred that has been trained to run against the best horses in the world. So it is in this generation which we live in this country. The kingdom of God cannot look like it's put together with bale and wire. This is the most sophisticated society in the history of the world. In my opinion, the most educated and the most intelligent young people in terms of what they know and what they understand and what they've been exposed to. So the kingdom of God has to look like the kingdom of God and talk like the kingdom of God. And everything that it executes and discharges must look like it just came right out of heaven. Like it just came right out of heaven. And so people, people say to me sometimes, they say, well, Reverend Watson, I'm thinking about coming to your church, and, and, and I don't know because you've got some professional folk over there. And I said, look, you come the way you want to come. Just come decent. I, I said, just come decent. Just, just come decent. You can come the way you want to come. But when I come, I'm going to look as good as I can. Now, I ain't got much to work with, but I can hang my suit up at night, hang my clothes, they land on the floor, 
stuff hanging up, take my shirts to the laundry. I like them starched up. Because when I come to the kingdom, I'm coming to look as good as I can because I'm coming to meet with the king. And I want when he show up, I want him to know I'm there at my post, ready to do what he's called me to do and to discharge this ministry and to be a faithful steward of the kingdom. Well, we'll conclude in a couple of weeks. But I want to encourage all of you. And my prayer is that we get 100% enlistment of the members of the Grace Bible Church. 100% will enlist to say, I want to be a steward of the kingdom. And so I'm willing to, to give an hour a week, two hours a week, what, I can give this much time, and here's when I can give it. What do you need for me to do? 100% participation for the church members. 100% participation for the church members and turning in your stewardship financial. If you're going to give $5 in a year, that's $5 more than what we got right now. We'll take it. And we'll say thank you. But 100% participation. And my prayer is that on one Wednesday night, before this year is over, we'll get 100% participation. That we get as many people out on Wednesday night for prayer and for fellowship as we get out on Sunday morning to demonstrate our commitment to being stewards of the kingdom. Some of you don't really understand what God has equipped you to do. What he has equipped you to do, what is in your spiritual DNA, it's already there. All it takes is for you to jump into the basket and say, Lord, I'm yours. And I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. And God will use you in a miraculous way that will bless you and that will encourage you. Stewards of the kingdom. Let's bow for prayer, shall we?